So I was a boy in a man's body. I looked the part, but I was still thought like a boy. I get in the ring, I'm looking around, and my heart's beating, and Brendan's talking to me. I can remember him talking about I couldn't hear the words. What's the word? Is it an overload? Overload, because so many things I didn't want to happen happened. Listen to me, half of the fight's gone. They were booing. But they weren't booing him, they were booing me. I've done 30 years of having to learn and understand the process of, of what makes you the ultimate fighter. You must be so brilliant with the gloves is off now. Yeah. Do you know the truth? Anthony Joshua against uh, Big Baby Miller. Ego can be your biggest enemy. Anthony Joshua for the first time let that corporate mask slip. You spoke about Joe and his fight with KSI. When he was speaking, I know I thought I could sort of turn you around. I met you in me. I will turn you into a beast. That the effect of after that fight, it will just make, put him out of tilter. I can put him back on track again. That night when you, you know, finally became world champion. Looking at the footage, it's a different person. The thing I love the most about sport is glory. Hard earned glory. I, you, you cannot choreograph it. It was like a spirit had lifted the weight of the world off my shoulders if to say, Eureka, you've got it. Everybody, welcome back to the process. We're chatting already about YouTube boxing and talking about this. <laughs> Johnny Nelson, who let me just start with this. I want to go with world champion, which is amazing. I've, I've had Bedell Riley on on the process, yeah. and he's been he spoke about his dream to get there. And I'm really excited to chat to you about the fact that you did get there, and yeah. and all the sort of. If I look at your career, the start and the end, I thought this is amazing. The, the start is this, 13 amateur fights, three victories. Yeah. Doesn't people, sound like a world champion, does people it? People didn't say I was shit behind my back. They <laughs> said it to my face. They said, you are shit. I'm like, oh, okay. And then <laughs> retired, undefeated world cruiserweight champion. Uh, I think you ranked second out of cruiserweights in the yeah, world. Yeah. So the two, that blows my mind. There's obviously yeah. a, an amazing journey in there. And I was sort of lucky enough to go down a YouTube wormhole and and look at your career and I'm so excited for people to to find out more mm. about you because I think a lot of people know about you as a broadcaster, but you've got this whole other life that I you've actually, had. I actually like that the, the people fact, don't know about. I actually like the fact that people forgot I boxed because it means I've like I've kind of succeeded in my other life. Yeah, and uh, and and it's like a lot of young kids now they look at the likes of Gary Lineker, forgetting he was England captain. Mm. Uh, and so, so to me, I think to myself, I like the fact that I forgot a box. So now and again, you'll get some smart ass telling me, what do you know about box? And I'll say, oh, a bit. Uh, yeah, I, I saw some of I saw an up and coming fighter saying that to you. Go, did you win a, were you a world champion? <laughs> yes, I was a world champion for five years. <laughs> six, it's crazy. Six, 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 six man, years, six. sorry. sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I think the, the bits in between are amazing. And, and I find boxing really interesting in terms of it being such such a cutthroat sport, such a ruthless sport. Mm. It's so binary in terms of whether you win or you lose. And also the impact after that is the same, same my, thing. My old trainer said about boxing and he loved boxing. He, 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 he slept, drank boxing. Mm. And he said, boxing at its best is the greatest sport in the world. At it's worst, it's a dirty, rotten, prostituting game. Yeah. Just like all the old films, you know, it still happens now. Uh, it's just in a more corporate way and with a shirt and tie on. Uh, boxing, uh, it brings the best and the worst out in people. It attracts the, the devils from the shadows. And, yeah. uh, and, you know, because you've got some young kid that's never been there before, that's that's got something about him that's that all of a sudden you see all the lights are shining on him. And he attracts the worst out in people, mm. unfortunately, and the best. Uh, so if you're fortunate enough to be around people that are looking after you and looking for your best interest, then it's a great story. Yeah, uh, I was fortunate enough to, to be with somebody that was that. Mm. But when I first met my, my old coach, Brendan Ingle, um, people said, he's a con man. Don't go near him. He doesn't, you know, he's, he's, he's just hustling people. And, and I can remember him asking me when I first went, on the first day I went to the gym and he said, what have you heard about me? And I thought, it's like I had Tourette's. I said, well, I've heard you're a con man. <laughs> <laughs> and when it came out of my mouth, I thought, and damn, I should have said how that. How at this point? Uh, I was 14, 14 years old. I was around at 14, 15 because... So I is left, that when you started boxing, 14? Yeah, f yeah, because I left school with uh, with no qualifications. So they walked me out of school. They like, just don't... Just come back for your exam. Just walk me to the right. gate. Wow. And uh, so... 
because I just, I wasn't bad. I was just a lovable rogue. I right. wasn't bad. I just liked, my mum used to say to us when we were younger, do you want to go to school today? I say, yeah. We had a choice. We didn't have to go. Mm. If we stayed at home, we'd have to tidy up. We couldn't go out, couldn't go out and play, but she, we had a choice. That's where I sort of met my, met my friends. Yeah. Trying to have a laugh. Yeah. So school was, I, I think now it's, I don't know what they call the, the lesson now, but when I was at school, the, the, the clever kids, they'd been in class doing geography, history, biology, or a science. Uh, and then you'd have a certain class I was in that certain class. Our class was called Step. And so these others outside <laughs> learning to ride a motorbike or learn. And so the, the clever kids would be looking out saying, why are those, why are those getting to treated where, where we've got to sit in class? At the time, it seemed unfair. But in hindsight, you look, you look now and you think these guys were getting their education. I just wasn't a clever kid at mm. school, um, academically clever. And uh, so when I was kind of walked out of school because I was classed as disrupting, I don't know why. Um, um, uh, that's when the re the journey really began, yeah. and, and even at the time, uh, I go back to schools now. Talk talk at schools. Even at the time, I had no idea what I wanted to do when uh, when, when I finished school. Well, that's it. I think that's why uh, my favorite thing about this podcast, and it's the thing that I think I naturally go to a lot of the time, is that that f that fear of it not working out. That mm. fear of uh, and there's so many people at that age, you know, in your twenties or even younger, whatever where you're kind of, you're just hoping that it's kind of going to work out. And that's why I want, that's why I'm so excited to talk to you because when you listen to Johnny now on Sky, after listening to this podcast, you're you're going to, you're going to look at it differently because I, I don't think people understand no, how much experience of every single situation within boxing that you have. And so, oh, so you had three world title fights before you won that first world title. Yeah, yeah. And I want to talk about all three of them yeah, in time. Yeah. Um, because that's, you know, when you hear someone talking, you go, oh, okay, that's just their opinion. This isn't just an opinion. Like, I just want to ram this, <laughs> I want to ram this home. This is like, the experience of the highs and lows are amazing. So, but the place I want to start is that those 13 amateur fights and getting just three victories, because why are you only getting three victories at that moment in time? What was the problem? Now, so at the time I didn't understand it. Looking back on it, I do understand what the process was. I mistook nerves for fear. I was a very nervous kid. If an adult spoke to me, I'd start crying. God knows why. Um, and, and, and now, you know, now you don't, you don't understand why you would stop loving? That's, not, that's what I'm saying. Now I understand at the time, I was just a nervous kid. Right. But I thought I was scared. You thought I mean, you were scared. I'm, yeah, I thought I was scared. I misunderstood nerves for fear. Right. So when I had that, when everybody has that nervous feeling. You might sweat, you might shake, you might stutter, you might sl whatever. And it's just as you're preparing yourself for whatever you're going to do. Yeah. When I got that, I thought I was scared. So when people call me a coward, uh, call me rubbish, call me scared, I actually believed them because I thought that's what I am. Mm. I didn't understand. I was actually nervous. Right. Um, and so when I started boxing, I didn't want to box. So, so the guys... Uh, when I'd left school, the school I went to, uh, it was it used to be an all girls Catholic school called Notre Dame. Uh, before that, it was St. Vincent's. Now it was it was in Notre Dame was in a posh side of Sheffield. They just opened it up for for guys to go in the school. I think I was a second year guinea pig guy at the school. Right. So so all my friends, yeah, all, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was great. Yeah, I'll in go. The summer. So <laughs> so all my friends. So there was more girls than boys in the school. So uh, so all my friends were from that side of town. Just probably about a dozen, if that black kids in the school. Mm. Some of my friends were either white, Italian or whatever. From, but they, they came from money. They picked kids from certain parts of Mundan, Sheffield to go to this school right. to tick the boxes. I was one of those kids. So when I'd left school, my friends at school would go on to work for their parents or go on to university or whatever because they had the, the academic intelligence to move on. Right. I didn't. School was fun for me. I'd come home. So I, I literally had to make a conscious decision to say, right, I've got to make some friends here. Right. Because I, I, I didn't really have those relationships with the guys that lived in my area like they all had with each other. Um, I'd listen to what youth club they're going to and just rock up by myself. Right. And, um, and my brother, he was my hero. He was a guy who followed everywhere. He was, I was a proper pest. So he started boxing. So I boxed because he boxed. Mm. So eventually when I ended up at Brendan's gym, uh, when I walked in, um, he said the rule was because we had different fathers. The rule was don't let anybody know we're related because if you do, they're gonna beat you up. 
that's the that's the <laughs> rule of the gym. Yeah. Unfortunately. So the big guy, you know, the thing, if I can't get you, I'll get your brother. Right. And so so we got away with it for about two years. So I, and I was I was training in the gym for two and a half years before I had a fight. And did you that, like it straight away? I hated it. Right. Absolutely hated it. But I only went to the gym to make friends. Mm. That was it. I didn't want to fight. I yeah. didn't want to when they were all talking about fine, I wasn't even interested in the conversation. I just thought all the guys, it's like a big youth club. Uh, but it was, it was, it was learning at the time. Now looking back in it, you know, one of the guys said, Brennan brainwashed you. And and I asked Brennan that. He said, Yeah, I positively brainwashed you, Brennan Ingham, my trainer. Yeah. I'm like, I prepared you for life. Um, and and so when I was boxing, when I started boxing, I didn't care if I won or lost. Mm. You know, I was just there with the guy, with the guys having a laugh. You, t- you talk about Brendan a lot, yeah, and uh, I can understand that because so Brendan Ingle was was your trainer, and yeah. also became you know a mentor for mm. you, huge impact in your life, and you know when you win that world title, you 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 know you dedicated to him and his gym. When you're talking there about I just needed to go out and find friends, that in my head as someone who's sort of you know a casual boxing fan, I, I when I think of boxers i think of ego i think of they tread their own path they do their own thing it's a very individual sport <laughs> rubbish, yeah. isn't that am i am i way off the mark generally or is that a specific thing to you in terms of you were you were quite happy to be led or you're pleased to be led i listen i'm not your your conventional fighter or your conventional champion most champions that get up there and become champion have got a bit of an ego mm. do think they're the, the alpha male do think that they're, they're, they're not human uh i actually I had to learn the hard way, uh, and and it was painful emotionally. It was painful physically. It was it was stressful, and it, I had to grow up under the eyes of all these people. And I don't mean just just people in the gym. I mean people from outside, people from my family. And what they would do is they would critique you. So if you're gonna work. Especially um, at Sheffield. And Sheffield, <laughs> Sheffield, you you were a student in Sheffield. So the student, and I think the big thing for me with Sheffield is there's in equal measure there's. They cut through the shit, mm-hmm. but they're, they're also just as warm. Yeah, and the two are actually a really lovely. That, that's pair. why. That's why I love Sheffield. Sheffield will tell people will tell you exactly how it is if you ask them. Yeah, and, and so if you if you proper bullshit around, they say hey, you're full of shit. You rubbish you. But if you go, <laughs> they'll give you support. Yeah, and I love Sheffield for that. There's no there's no there's no bullshit about mm-hmm. it. So uh, so as I was going through, if I box if I boxed and people knew, they'd say you rubbish you. They wouldn't like. I do it behind my back. Yeah. Uh, I can remember sparring in the gym once and this guy came in and he was watching. He was like the gym caretaker and, and just a spectator came in. He said, yeah, see that kid there? He's crapping, watch him. And I could hear him talking, thinking, <laughs> oh, I can hear you. But I believed yeah. I was no good. Uh, and Brendan Ingle always said to me, look, you're a mummy's boy. Uh, and I'm thinking, no, I'm not. <laughs> and <laughs> you're a you <laughs> no, I'm not. Uh, and he said, you'll not grow up until you you know, in your uh, late 20s. You mm. need to move out of your mum's house. You need to stand on your own two feet. You need to live life. Um, and you, you're going to go through the ups and downs, but you're going to experience every aspect of boxing. And when you do, no one will be able to tell you anything about boxing. And so so for people that watch this and they go, I'm not that guy, I'm not that alpha male, what would you say to to them? Uh, listen, I, There's someone in such a yeah, yeah, man's exactly. world. Right? And, and so boxing is not... Uh, um, I'm not a tough man. I'm just in a tough sport. You understand? And what I'm saying is, I'm not a hard man. I didn't. I couldn't. I could cause trouble, but I could never back that up. Mm. I'd be the first one to slip out of it, talk my way out of it. So uh, you've got to understand. You don't have to be that individual uh, to get to the top. Uh, you've got to think smart. Uh, be honest with yourself. Uh, uh, and if you think, and if you listen. If you just listen and learn, that's the best way. I was in the gym. I was the worst in the gym. And we were just talking about this yesterday. I was talking with Kid Galahad um, and uh, a couple of other fighters. And, and I was the worst in the gym. I used to get beat up by everybody. But as time had gone on and I stuck it out and they left, they went and did whatever they were doing, went to prison, went and got jobs, whatever. Mm. I was still in the gym. I was still listening, still, still learning, still taking the sticks, still still, walking forward, still having yeah. people saying, you don't want to be doing that. Everyone, all of a sudden, everybody turns into Angelo Dundee telling you how good you could be if you just did this, that, and the other. I stuck it out. Mm. So once I became world champion, these guys that used to beat me up in the gym are like, how did you do that? You were rubbish. I say, yeah, I know. And one of the prime examples is, I I can remember my first professional fight, I lost to a guy called Peter Brown uh, from Hull. And uh, 
And, so uh, you've had these amateur fights, then you, you've gone professional. I've gone professional, obviously. So, sorry. Yeah, so, yeah, no, so no, was, I was amateur. And, but and you lost I, your first professional yeah, fight. But I, I, so I boxed, yeah, so I, I was amateur. I had 10, about 13 professional fight, amateur fights and won three. The reason why I turned professional is because the last prize I got as a as an amateur boxer, apart from getting abused for being so rubbish and, and losing all the time, I got a torch and a quilt. That was the prize. <laughs> it wasn't even a cup. <laughs> it was a torch and a quilt. And a quilt. And I'm like... Wow, because there's I'm, no money in amateur boxing. There's no and money in amateur boxing. Dude, that's what I'm saying. So, but, but that's what I got. I got a torch and a quilt. I didn't even get a loser's cup. A torch and a quilt. And uh, sorry, I won my last amateur fight against a guy who I'd lost to twice before. Uh, and um, and so I got a torch and a quilt. I thought, what am I doing this for? So when I spoke to Brendan and said I want to turn professional, mm. he said, you like to make a better professional than you will an amateur because you're tall, you're lanky. By the time you're getting into it, it takes confidence and time. But if you stay amateur, you're never going to get that that confidence with you because you're getting rushed for three rounds. Right. So I turned professional. I fought a guy called Peter Brown. Peter Brown beat me. Uh, years later, I became world champion. And I was out with my friends. We thought we'd go to this club down in, in Hull. And um, there was a big queue outside. It was raining. And as it was raining, uh, the, the head doorman saw me and told me to come to the front. I didn't That's take it nice. for granted and walk straight in. So me and my mates went, mates went to the front and we, we got, as we were walking in, Peter Brown's there, he's one of the head doormen. Wow. And he said, Johnny Nelson, he, and he, I give him a hug and how are you mm. doing everything? And it, all the other bouncers were there. I said, tell these lads, I've told them, didn't I beat you? I said, yeah, he did. Really good fight. I told you, I told you I beat him. <laughs> so you can tell these guys are having that bit of banter between yeah. them. So then we got him out of the rain and went in the club. They put us in a VIP area and I'm like, shh. Listen, I, I'm I'm no fool, and unlike anybody, if you're treated nice in the club, you think shit, this is great. I don't expect it. I'm like, boy, shut up, just ride it right away, right away. <laughs> so we get inside the VIP bit. So one of my mates said, "Why did you do that?" I said, "What do you mean?" He said, "Well, he was bigging himself up off your back, saying that he beat you, and uh, and trying to mug you off a little bit." I said, "No, not really, because at the end of the day, look where we are. Uh, we're sat inside a club. It's nice and warm. He stood on the door." His security. Now, eventually, one of his friends are going to be smart enough to say to him, if you were that good, how comes he's in there and you're right here? Yeah. And the penny will drop to him. Then mm. he'll be thinking, God, if I'd just stuck at it. And that there's so many people that beat me, so many people that beat me up, that, and they'll have that regret. They might not admit it publicly, but they'll have that regret inside thinking, if I'd have just stuck it out, if Johnny Nelson can do it, mm. why couldn't I? That's all it was. I, know, I, I, I said when, when I won the world title, I am not naturally talented. I'm not naturally gifted. I'm not a brain box. I just listened. And if you listen and you believe and you, and you, you find a way. And apply. Yeah, you can apply it. And, I'm, and that's why I said I'm a product of the gym mm. because Brendan molded me. And it was the nicest feeling ever because Brendan's Ingle system was always mocked or, or pointed at saying they're doing it wrong. And I was built from scratch. So I wasn't a, an ex, a outstanding amateur that he, he took up. I was a kid that was completely, excuse my French, shit. So he made shit into a lump of gold. Yeah. And so I wanted people to say, Brendan can do that with me. That I had 13 amateur fights, only won three. Lost my first three professional fights. And out of 10, I think I won, I probably won six out of the first 10 professional fights. If I can, and turn me into a world champion, then it, I'm saying Brendan Ingle's system works. Mm. You just have to apply it. Well, when I, when I looked at your record, because, you know, there, there are these great lines, and I want to talk about legacy a little bit later on, but yeah. like, and because that's such a huge thing in, in boxing now, and I'm sure it probably always has been, but it feels like it's even bigger now. But when I looked at your record, th th those 12, de uh, 12 defeats, yeah. and it just, it just makes it so interesting to me that when everyone's going, oh, you know, Floyd Mayweather never won. But and his legacy, his legacy is incredible. But there are people that will, will have lost a lot less fights than you. Yeah. with not the same legacy that yeah, you have. Because, you know I mean? because the mindset now for, in any sport, people think if you lose, you're done. Losing is part of learning. Mm. So, so to get to get wisdom, you've got to go through experiences, good and bad. And people, and it just doesn't apply to sport. So, so when things are good, that good experience, thinking, yeah, I love life, it's the best. And then when shit things are happening. You're thinking, why is this happening to me? Mm. Well, let's let's talk about that first 
world title yeah. opportunity. So obviously, you know, it started to click. You're starting to get, you know, victories under your belt. And then that that fight comes. And it was it in Leeds or Sheffield? Sheffield. It was in Sheffield, Sheffield. yeah. So it, that's, that's how it should be written, right? And then you walk in there and what happened? It actually didn't click. So what had happened was I was a boy in a man's body. Right. Uh, so I looked the part, but I was still thought like a boy. Mm. And so as Brendan's teaching me along, he said, look, we've got to crack for the world title. Uh, you'll learn. Uh, you'll learn a lot. You could win this if all the stars aligned right, but you but you physically can do this. How did you react to that? Did, were you so, a bit like, come on, mate, I need you to... No, no, <laughs> I, I, I like... Sh Brendan's a straight shooter. Yeah. yeah. And so he said, you can win this. And he's telling me this is possible because he understands the odds. Uh, Carlos Stelian at one point was the number one cruiserweight in the world. He'd only lost to uh, Evander Holyfield. He was, he, was, he was rated as one of the best. He'd knocked out somebody, Sammy Reason or somebody like that in England before, sleeped him, took him out. So Brendan's basically saying, you can win this. You've got to find that, find that part where you can, can win this. So when it came to, so up to that point, I'd won the British title. I'd won Central Air and everything. But people don't understand when I was still thinking like a boy. So he, all the wins I'd got up to that point, I didn't think I was good. I just thought the opposition was crap. Mm. And that, this, this, you've got to understand what I'm saying. I didn't yeah, think yeah. I was good. I thought they was bad. Okay. So I didn't believe that I was something special. I just thought they were really bad. And th my mindset was so upside down. So I didn't think, yeah, I'm good. I just but thought. Th that's a confusing thought in itself, though, the idea that you're, you don't believe in yourself, yeah. but you still have an understanding that you're better than. Yeah, that's is that, not, is not, that not, you that's, being hard on no, yourself? No, 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 exactly. So what I'm saying is, again, I didn't believe I was good. I just thought they were bad. Right. And so I didn't but you're think... you're kind of disqualifying yeah, yeah, them a little yeah, bit, yeah, that's aren't right, you? That's right, that's yeah. right. So, so I didn't give myself credit for what these guys had achieved and then believe and think, well, Johnny's done this, 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 and this. So you're actually not bad. I didn't think like that. Mm. I just thought, well, they were bad. So my confidence hadn't grown. And so all of a sudden when it came for a crack, and, and I, I was on a hustle thinking, shit, I'm getting away with it so far. So, so, uh, so when it came to fight for this world title against... Uh, 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 Carlos Lane for Puerto Rico and this guy that had done everything travel the world my day of reckoning was coming and I knew my day of reckoning was coming and I, I thought shit I'm getting exposed this night here so when it, it front the, in our gym we always wanted to certain guys you want to be on TV you want to be in the newspaper in boxing uh, you want to be on the front page of the boxing news right and so that was like yes we, we've got the we've got the the golden fleece that's what you want i was on the front page of uh, box news johnny be good big picture of me and i'm like fuck so with good was bad all the guys went yes johnny you've got it and i'm thinking shit <laughs> more people are going to see me get exposed here right so brendan's talking to me and talking to me talking to me and i can see brendan understands I've got to get this kid to see he can possibly believe he can and do it. And do you feel that you're taking the fight because Brendan says so or because you believe you can do it or because there's a bit more money here and if I'm hustling was, at the moment... It was, it was never about the money. Right. Uh, and, and But that is something that happens, right? Yeah, yeah, of course it does. But it was never about the money. Uh, to me, I knew Brendan believed in me. Problem is I didn't believe in me. Mm. And I wanted to believe in what he believed in. I wanted to see what he could see. So when it came to it, I thought, well, maybe when the bell goes, it'll just all kick into place. What Brendan says can happen, can happen. Mm. Brendan had more belief in my ability than I did uh, because he could see what I could do. There's uh, a bravery in that moment, though, of, of still stepping forward when you're scared and you don't Yeah, my God, no, yeah. That's, that's so so I can remember going to the Sheffield City Hall and it was packed out. But before that, everywhere I went, I had so many friends. Oh, my God, Johnny tapped me on the back. I'm like shit, I'm going to get exposed and I'm smiling and living it up thinking, oh, this penny dropped when the bell goes. I got into the, the city hall and I was backstage, I opened the curtains and it was everybody I'd seen in my life, people on TV, people, old friends, old teachers, they were all there. Mm. And I thought, shit. And what's it like being in that ring when you've got people, like normally in a in a big crowd, you can't see the eyeballs, but in a boxing ring, you are literally just standing there on your own so, and you can see all right, the so most th important people in the front yeah, row. So, that was, so this is the experience because when he eventually won the world title, you understood when you walk in, you do not give a shit about anything or anybody. You are in a zone. I was so, when, but when I first boxed for the world title, I was taken in by all of that. I'm looking around. Wow. I saw Linda Lusardi sat in the front page three. I'm like, she's going to sing me. Oh my God. I saw Frank Bruno. I saw the cast of EastEnders there and, and, and Coronation Street there. I'm like, shit. 
And it just dawned on me. So I'd bottled it before I even got out there. And so all of a sudden I turned into that 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 little boy that couldn't understand the difference between nerves and fear. Yeah. So when I've got this nervous feeling coming around, and remember up to this point, every time it came to going into a fight, even the fights I won, I used to wish my opponent didn't turn up. Really? I used to wish, I'm thinking, God, please don't turn up. Don't turn up. Even in the, as an amateur traveling in the minibus going to the fights, thinking, don't turn up. Because that usually happened, they wouldn't turn up. Right. And then, then I talk about whatever, what I would have done, what I would have learned. I think eventually people realize you're full of shit, Johnny. Mm. You've, only, you've, only, you've only won three out of 13 fights. And so, but I still had that same feeling. And I was British champion at this point. And so people, when they saw this vision of Johnny Nelson, British champion, they thought I was a confident young individual. I was com I was I was as naive as 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 a civilian on the street, and so so now all of a sudden, that my day of reckoning has come. I get in the ring. I'm looking around, and my heart's beating. And Brendan's talking to me. I can remember him talking about. I couldn't hear the words, but he was talking. He, he was talking. I'm like, and I, I can remember him saying, "Johnny, pay attention." Johnny, pay attention. I'm thinking. I can't hear what you're saying. What? And what, what's the word? Is it an overload or is it, do you feel a bit sort of frozen or a bit paralyzed by it? What, I, what is so, it? So overload because so many things I didn't want to happen happened. I didn't want to embarrass myself. I did. I didn't want to get knocked out. I didn't get knocked out, but I, I, I embarrassed myself. I didn't want to get hurt. I didn't, but I embarrassed myself. I didn't want to, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I, I thought it'll just click into place, but I embarrassed myself. Mm. And all these things I wanted, I wanted, but I didn't have the, the mental tools to put it into practice. I'd come back to the corner every after every round and Brennan was talking to me. I can't hear, I couldn't hear what he said. I can remember his lips moving and I can remember him getting in front of me, pleading with me, saying, Johnny, listen to me. You could change your life. And I can understand all the people's frustrations. Because in Sheffield then, I was getting paid decent money. They saw a young young guy having the chance to change his life. Throw it away. Now, if you're if you're if you're there and you're earning your hard earned wages and you've paid the ticket to come in and you see somebody with the opportunity of changing his life and he doesn't, mm. you're going to be pissed off at him. And just to explain to people who, don't, who haven't seen that fight, and you can watch that fight. Yeah. Um, I, I, I saw an interview with you saying that you you've never have you still never watched that fight. I think got past round three. Got past round three. <laughs> yeah. So the fight is it's a lot of. There's not a lot of punches it in was the like, fight. It was like basically. a foxtrot. So, so I drew. I, I actually didn't lose. Yeah. I drew for the WBC title. I wonder if you just gave it to me. By a distance as well. Yeah. I watched it this morning. And I actually, I'll be honest, I did do the thing where you go, I'm going to put Fast it on forward. two. Well, no, I'll put it on the two times. <laughs> and it does look like uh, the, your opponent, De Leon, is standing in the middle and you just yeah, keep getting right. round him and that's round right. him. And that, and that, so once you got into that, I'm like, Johnny, mm. come on, stop. Brennan's pleading with me and everything. And... The funny thing was, I used to dream about my results. This is going to get a bit weird now. I used to dream about my it. results of fights. And uh, I tell Brenda, Brenda, I'll win this. And they say, well, yeah, I'll, I'll win this. I'll stop this kid. I won't hurt me. I'll win this fight. And Brenda say, well, you sure? Yeah, no problem. Well, you just keep it between you, me and you. No problem. So he's thinking, do, do, do. So I tell him. I knew. I just, and I was, I was always right. For the De Leon fight, I had a dream that, uh, uh, and I didn't understand the dream that at the end of the fight, both our hands were up. No, my hand was up and De Leon was smiling and there was a, a white guy with an afro and a thick pinstripe suit and a tie on, white shirt, black tie, and he was stood uh, front row and he was putting two fingers up like that. This was my dream. So I told Brendan the dream. And I said, Brent, I don't understand it. I don't understand the dream. My hand was up and he was smiling. There was a guy putting two fingers up. And he went, listen, don't worry about it. You don't worry about it. You just concentrate on what you've got to do. Like, yeah, you're all right, Brent. Fight went through. The fight was a stink. It was the highest sporting viewed, um, uh, viewed uh, sporting event that year mm. on television. Anywhere. Wow. Uh, um, um, so it was the highest, highest viewed uh, event, sporting event that year. So everybody saw it. Mm. Um, uh, I got a draw. Uh, I, I got a draw. And when the that bell goes at the end, the yeah. booing. Yeah. Well... He wants to try and influence the, the crowd that he's won. I got a it's draw and they were booing. But they weren't booing him, they were booing me. I live there. He can go back to Puerto Rico. He'd already been in two or three fights like that already. They were booing me. So it's like, oh God, please stop. Just, oh. And then I looked around. He was smiling because his hand was up as well. Mm. And my hand was up, which meant he kept the title. So he was smiling. I looked into the crowd. The guy with the afro and the pinstripe suit was there. Fucking wankers. And I'm like, 
And so all of a sudden, I'm like a little boy. Oh, that guy in my dream, oh, he's smiling. <laughs> oh Trust God. me, I'm like, what the fuck? And, and, and this was a dream. And I'm trying to bring, look, this is the last thing on their mind, thinking, Johnny, you just embrace yourself. I'm like, my dream. I'm, I'm. Yeah. So all of a sudden, I, it was in a, I was in turmoil. Uh, and then I went back to the dressing room, got back to the dressing room. It was horrible. Everybody's looking at me as I've got Bay now, what's your problem? That was the worst and the best thing that could ever happen to my, me in my life because it was it was the, the beginning of the journey to growing up. Mm. I can remember being walking into the city hall, it's packed out, everybody slapping me on the back saying good luck and everything. Coming out of the city hall, sat on the steps with my friend Mark Willie, people are walking past me, it's raining. And, and he's got his arm around me saying, look, it's all right, mate. And people are just blanking me, ignoring me. Uh, I can remember guys before the fight saying, we want to sponsor you, we want to give you this, that, and the other. I, I found human nature, that I found a real cruel side to human nature. I, met, I learned many things on that night. Mm. And there was a guy, uh, uh, one thing I always wanted to do was buy my mum's house uh, um, because I didn't want her to be in a position where she got old and she had to move out. So I bought my mum's house. And this guy said, look, I'll do the double glazing for you. You know, after this fight, I'll sort you out. I'll give you for nothing, son. I'm, oh, thank you. Great stuff. They come and they, they, I'd say, I'll get someone to measure up Monday after the fight. Yeah, great stuff. Uh, and everybody's promised you the sun, moon, and stars, sponsored cars, uh, uh, clothing, everything. The fight went about. Uh, it was obviously a shit result. Well, in hindsight, it wasn't a drill, but it was a shit fight. Mm. Uh, it was boring. It was called the, the famous boar draw. Uh, I used to see little clips in the newspapers and it said there was a man in a coma for 10 years and we put the Johnny Nelson fight on in his room and he woke up to turn the TV off. <laughs> these, these were the... <laughs> it was a great joke. Yeah, uh, it's good. And, but these were little captions. So when you look at the newspaper, you see these little cartoons in, it's about somebody. Mm. So again, it's funny now, but at the time I'm thinking, you know what, you're talking about somebody... Someone's father, someone's brother, someone's whatever. You're talking about somebody. So that's somebody, that somebody's getting hurt. Yeah. At this moment in time, that somebody was me. So it wasn't so funny at the time. Mm. Now I look back and I think, good joke. Yeah, but if you, you know, <laughs> God, we see that far too much at the moment. They're in the moment of it, yeah. it's so different to, you know, miles down the line when yeah. you know it's yeah. worked so, out. And this is one of the experiences when I say you've got to go through experiences to get wisdom. Mm. This is one of those bad experiences that I had to go through to get wisdom. So on the Monday... I, uh, I'm thinking, you know what, John, you just try and get on with it. You just, I'm just a Sheffield lad. I'm just, that's it. I've always been a Sheffield lad. That's it. Just through and through. I don't understand. Even now when people come up to me and say, can I have your autograph? I'm like, really? <laughs> All right. And I'll, I'll do it. And I'm very friendly to everybody because I'm shocked that people, I don't get why. Mm. I'm like, how do you know it's me? I, I don't get it. It just doesn't dawn on me. So, uh, and I mean, anywhere, yeah. we, as in New York and people do, I'm like, what the, it just doesn't comprehend. Anyway, the Monday morning, uh, I phoned this guy up about the double glaze and I went, I think his name was Stuart. Hey, Stuart, you're right. He said, yeah, I'm all right. I could see straight away in that, that response, I thought, it's a bit arrogant there. Yeah. And before he's like, yes, mate, yes, yeah, I'm all right. I said, uh, I'm just wondering when you're going to send the fitters around to come and measure up. He went, you are. He said, I'm not saying no fitters around to your house. You fucking embarrassed me, son. I had friends around at my house. We had a we had a party at my house. It was embarrassing. Because you're getting fuck off from me. Wow. Sheffield. Yeah. I'm like Not as much warmth. I there. thought, <laughs> shit. And but and, and it was just and it wasn't a fact, well, it was a fact that he blew me out, but it's how he spoke to me. Yeah. From from it was like day and night. I and Pete, I had an inboxing. You've got not just got one boss as though you're going to a job. You've got thousands of bosses. So every day you've got to cross people and they are going to say, you were shit you or you were great you. Mm. Uh, and and it's hard because you've got to hold it down. You've got to think you, it's, 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 it's punishing. Um, and I was getting punished in Sheffield. I was getting punished left, right and centre. People give me crap. And I kept saying to Brendan, Brendan, I can't take this, man. So he said... Uh, and Barry Hearn, Eddie Hearn's dad, he was my promoter at the time. Yeah, because there's you... a moment after the fight where he goes to you and you, you do a face where you're, you're kind of, I can't figure out what that face is. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, what was your relationship with Barry Hearn? Like, can you remember that moment? You know what, Barry Hearn, if you think Eddie's good, Barry was the Don. Really? You know, Barry was a sharp talk. He was like years ahead of his time. And so, and I remember little Eddie being 10 years old when I bought for you being title, like messing about in Germany. And, and but Barry was years. He was a clever guy. Mm -hmm. Was sharp. He's done where he's done. Okay, so and I'm like, you know what? He said, I'll get you fighting in a few weeks' time. I thought, good on you. Um, 
And uh, Bar- Bar- um, and Barry got me a European title fight within no time after after that. But uh, but yeah. my first fight after fighting for the world title, I was getting that much stick, and Brennan knew it. Brennan just kept talking me talking to me about old school fighters, Jack Johnson and you know, you know Hansen and Floyd Patterson and and all. I'm thinking, why are you telling me about these people? What about me? Mm. You know, my head's done in. People are giving me stick. People are abusing me. They they're putting stickers on my car and stuff. Pro, it was proper bad. I couldn't go anywhere. And I'm not an aggressive guy. I'm not a fighter. Yeah. So when you're getting abused verbally and, and picked on, it gets to you. Well, that's what I wanted to ask. Was like, you know, you've got such a strong voice in Brendan Ingle in your in your whole career. But when you are in that moment, yeah. like I was saying, like, how... D- and you're someone who hasn't got the self-confidence that you would like to have. When you're in that moment, how do you deal with all of the voices? I couldn't. And like, that's why Brendan knew. And, and, and listen... Yeah, and which talk, ones to trust yeah, as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so he was the only person that stuck by me, bar my my friend Mark Willie. But Brendan was the only person that stuck by. Me. I even went home and uh, and I was went to my mum's house. And mum said, "Why didn't you hit him? Why did you box like that? You rubbish." I'm like, "What? I'm, this is my sanctuary. This is where I can just be Johnny." <laughs> yeah, yeah, mum would say, know. "Johnny, go to the shop, and get me some biscuits." I'm just Johnny. Mm. But even even when I went home, people are like. And I can get it because I'm still a little brother. So they'll take the piss, you know. And I'm, I'm thinking, ah, this is just not the right time. And so so the only person that really got it was Brendan. And Brendan kept reciting old fighters. And he said, look, it's the same story, different actors. What's happened to you has happened in the past to other fighters. And look how they went through it. And he recited so many stories about fighters. I'm thinking, at the time I thought, I really don't need this. So uh, Brendan put an advert in the local newspaper <clears throat> saying Johnny Nelson apologizes to the Sheffield public for letting them down. And he, he is a, he's a, he's appealing for their help. He needs sparring partners. Uh, and he's willing to pay 750 pound a week. I did you know, agree to this? Uh, no, <laughs> this was it. one of Brendan's stunts. I see. And he didn't tell me he was doing it. So this is the Friday uh, in the Sheffield star. Uh, he's willing to pay 750 pound a week for anybody that can last a week with him to help him prepare for his next fight. And I thought, you know what? I just, I, could, I don't need this attention because I'm getting enough stick as it is. Mm. Anyway, the Sunday morning, uh, I went to the gym to train and it's, the road's packed out. There's a church across the road from the gym. I thought it was it was a church service. So I'm driving, I'm thinking, shit, I can't even park anywhere. So I'm parked up, I'm like, looking at the church, walked in the gym, the door hit somebody. As I, I pushed the door open, I'm like, it's packed out. And I'm looking and I'm seeing people I know. Jamie Reeves, world's strongest man. You know, people are like, what are you doing? I'm all right. And I'm, you know, I'm thinking, oh, Jim's packed out. What's going on? So as I walked to the front, I'm looking. All right, all right. I said, Ben, what's happening? He said, oh, they've come to answer the ad in the newspaper. So the smile all of a sudden turned to a, you fucking what? So all these people that were my friends mm. or that knew me or that were strangers, they thought they could beat me up. Oh, they wow. all came for so some. I was waiting. I was waiting. Yeah, and, I, and I thought, you, so that, that happiness turned into despair. And I'm like, I'm going to fucking kill him. Wow. I was so pissed. He went, go and get changed. And so all of a sudden, I'm like, it, I was just, it was dark. Mm. So, I thought this was going to be this like nice nah, moment. I go, we're no, here for each other. It was <laughs> dark. It was a dark time. So I'm looking at him thinking, you bastards. And again, it was one of those times where human nature, you think, you cruel, cruel people. Mm. I'm getting my, my, my boots on. Brendan got in the ring and he pulled an envelope out. He said, people, he's very good at, at capturing audience. People, he said, uh, I've uh, been receiving a letter for the last few weeks, every week uh, from somebody. Let me just read it out for you. Brendan didn't tell me about this letter. And he opened the letter and he pulled three white feathers out of the letter. Does anybody know what this stands for? And one guy said, they used to give it you in the Foreign Legion if you were a coward, they'd give it you. Uh, he said, right. And I'm like, where's it going with this? I'm pulling up diamond laces on. He said, there's a letter. Johnny Nelson is disgraced to Sheffield. Uh, he should never put a pair of boots on again or gloves on. Uh, I was embarrassed watching it. I was embarrassed to say I'm from Sheffield. He's reading this letter. I'm like, what the fuck? He said, could the person that wrote this letter... Uh, could you please stand forward? And I'm like, and now I'm at bottom lips going, thinking, yeah, I'm going to hit you, bro. <laughs> this guy then stands forward. He's dressed like up. Rambo. He's got a frigging bandana on, vest on, army trousers, army boots. I thought, you 
backfiring. Jumps. I'm trying to tie my legs up really quick. And he went, he, he said, come up. So the guy came to the ring and said, so explain to me about this letter. He went, yes, Nelson was shit. Me and my wife was watching the fight. He was shit. It was embarrassing. And uh, I couldn't believe it. I caught. And my wife said, you can do better than that. So we saw the advert and we need a three-piece suite. So my wife said, come down, get that money. So I'll have that money. So I want to spar with Nelson. I'll fuck him up. He's not saying it behind my back. He's saying it whilst wow. I'm sat there like I'm some plant. And all the crowd are there like, yeah, yeah. And they don't, it was like a mob. And I thought, I'm going to kill him. So Brendan said, uh, do you want to warm up first? And he went, no, no. He said, come on, I want you to warm up first. There was a young Ryan Rhodes. I think he was about 13. Uh, he just warmed up with this young lad. He said, he said, I'm not spotting him. He's a kid. He went, no, no, I'll wait. And so I thought, so you know when you're angry, you, mm. you cry. You're crying because you're not. You, and, and they didn't want people to think I'm crying because he's upset me. I'm crying because I'm, I want to kill him. Tough, yeah. So I'm trying to do everything fast, get my gloves on fast. Looks like I'm scared. I'm thinking, oh, I just want to kill him. Get my stuff on. So I went round to get my gloves like tied on, like shaking. I want to kill him. So Brennan said, you know, he pulls me close. He said, you behave yourself. You are not. All right, Brennan, you listen to me, behave yourself. All right, Brennan. So Brennan wanted me to put a show on and just to just show people how hard I think show I'm, the levels. I'm just gonna batter him. I'm not give a shit. Yeah, Brennan, all right. You behave yourself. Yeah, listen to me. Yeah, Brennan, yeah, Brennan, yeah, Brennan. I thought, fuck him, we kill him. So climbed the stairs, got in the ring, uh, and the guy had his head guard on and his gloves on. And Brennan said, So you know what you're doing? All you have to do is four rounds today and every day for a week, and the money's yours. I thought, you won't get past one round. So Brennan said, off you go. So this guy, he rushed at me. I'm, I'm like, as he rushed, I just stepped out of the way and he missed. I thought, this is beyond a joke. Mm -hmm. It's shit. Yeah. So in my head now, I'm thinking, now I want to hurt him, but I don't want to knock him out. Because if I knock him out, he can't feel the pain. So I need to hurt him where he's conscious and he can't feel it, but he can feel the pain. <laughs> right. So in my head, as he do, I'm thinking, right, shall I hit him in the throat? Then I'll swallow, swallow his gum shield. Or shall I give him a body shot? Now I'm not going to give him a body shot. I'm having this thinking, where shall I hit him to give the most pain and he's conscious? Mm. So I thought, I'll hit him in the throat. <laughs> right? <laughs> so no, I thought, I'll just whack him in the throat. So as I went to hit him, he ducked down. I hit his forehead. And his head went back. And as he went, the head went back. He went, whoa, 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 whoa. And went down on one knee. I'm like, we haven't we aren't finished yet. Mm -hmm. He went down on one knee. He said, no, 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 no. None of this, none of this. And I'm like, what are you doing? And Brennan said, get up, get up. He said, no, no, none of this. Because all of a sudden, the seriousness of this situation kicked in. For him, when yeah. you've got somebody big and he stood there and posing figure in front of you, all of a sudden, something that looked so easy on TV, that fear of shitting yourself kicks in. Yeah. So now he, out of fear, he's rushing me. And he's thinking, I'm going to get killed here. Mm. And I missed and hit him on his forehead because I was aiming for his throat. And I, like snapped his head back. He pulled the glove off and jumped out, throwing the stuff. So I ran after him. And Brendan said, shut the door. Don't let Johnny out of it. So he shut the door. And this guy had run out of the, out of the gym. I thought, wanker. Because I thought, I've not, I've not got what I wanted. So, so he said, does anybody else want in? All of a sudden, Jamie Reeves, he said, I, I only come to watch them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I'm fine. And so two or three got in. They didn't last a round. Yeah. And then people just drifted out. I think three people at most. And I thought, I thought I, it just gave me a harsh life's lesson. Uh, the one thing you can't predict is human nature. And unfortunately, uh, people will we'll just be people. Never be surprised by human nature. Mm. So when this guy was being mean, when I was getting stick and criticism, looking back on it now, that's just their, it, it, that's just their personality. It's like, I can't complain if I put my, ma my hand in the mouth of a crocodile and he bites my hand off. Mm. That's what he does. Yeah. So if Pete, I can't be upset by your nature, how you are. That's just how they are. But I wouldn't let it measure, wouldn't let it shape me as an individual. Mm. But it was a hard lesson. And so then, all of a sudden, I stopped caring what everybody else thought. Well, because because that's when when you and it's so clear when you look at the footage between that first fight yeah. and uh, you know the the fight when you you win that world title. Um, the the second one. Let's talk about the second one just yep. quickly. Um, because obviously you know you failed to to win the title yeah. again. So now I was fighting for the IBF title in in uh, Fred in uh, in Virginia, uh, uh, and I flew out there. And so this is how about fighting's change. I flew out there. It was me, Prince Asim Hamid, 
uh, Clifton Mitchell, John Ingle, the few of us to fly out there for the fight. We flew into Detroit to fly on to Washington. Or, and then as we got to Detroit, we stood in the queue waiting. So one of the security guys come up talking away. Hey, boys, how you doing? We're talking. Really friendly guy it was. Mm. And he said... Uh, he said, uh, and he said, what are you guys doing here? Oh, he's boxing, he's boxing for the world title. All oh, right, and he's talking really nice and friendly with us. And then he walked away, and we went to get through customs, and he went, you here? What's he talking? Same guy that was really nice to us. You here? So I'm like, what have I done here? Hmm. So they said, your, 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 your paperwork, uh, you've not got a work permit. Uh, you're going back. Pull me out the queue. And this I'm is like, days before I the fight, right? No, no, the Saturday before. Right. The week before, I'm like, I'm fine next Saturday, he said, you've not got a work permit. You're going back. I'm like, no, oh, come on. No. So they took my passport off me, kept me in the airport in Detroit. It was a Friday, sorry. Flew me back on the Saturday. Um, um, so now I've just done the, the round trip to Detroit, back to there again. Jet I'm like, shit, I'm looking for all the excuses to think. God, it's messing my training up, messing my, my, my balance up, messing my, I'm going to be shattered and everything. Had to go to the embassy on the Monday or Tuesday to, to, to get a visa to fly back out again. Now, I'm still thinking, can I do this? But all this to and fro in, I've gone back. I've done like three round trips in, in the space of a couple of days. And I thought, damn, and I got in the ring. I can remember getting the ring to fight. And I knew physically I'd, I was there, mm. mentally I still wasn't over this the shock of, of the, 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 what happened with the, the Leon fight. And it took their corner man, Americans are like, shit houses, sorry. Um, <laughs> the man, he shouted out, remember the, the Leon fight, he ain't got no heart. And when he said that, um, <laughs> I thought, bastard. So straight away I'm on the negative, I'm on the back foot because I'm believing what people are saying. When people are saying, you're crap, I'm actually believing it. So this guy's telling me I've got no heart. Mm. I'm believing him, I've got no heart. So I'm fighting like I've got no heart. Johnny Nelson fighting like a pacifist here tonight. And it was just like, I thought, nah, it's not your time yet. And I lost on points. And and I shouldn't have done. I can remember Naz being in the corner with Brendan. He was handing the bucket up. And Brendan's screaming at me, going mad. No, 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 listen to me. Don't say you know. Half of the fight's gone. And Naz is saying, Bren, don't talk to him like that, Bren. Just, just, just. And Bren, and I said, Bren said to Naz, get out of the corner, shift. Johnny, listen to me. You can do this, listen to And he knew, boom, I'd zoned out. I'd gone again. I'd gone again. And so he had to scream and shout and do everything to get me out my head in it. Again, a, a harsh lesson learned. Mm. But again, what happened then, nobody would touch me in the boxing world. Nobody would put me on their shows. They wouldn't even have me as an opponent. Nobody would touch me. I was like, I was like rabies. <laughs> Nobody wants to know. So then, um, Brenda said, "Right, this is this is how we got to do it." I was on the road. I, I more or less lived in Germany, uh, uh, France. Um, did I do Italy? I think I did Italy for about six years. I was on the road as a sparring partner. He said, "You've got to learn. You've got wow. to learn this. You've got to want this for you. Nobody else." And it was the best thing he did. I was out there as a sparring partner, sparring with the best in the world. And I mean the best, the mm. creme de la creme of our sport from Germany, from East Germany, from France and from all over. I was their sparring partner. So then usually when you go as a sparring partner, I got to explain to you, if you're a sparring partner, you're paid as a piece of meat. So the fighter that has employed you, he's going to sharpen his tools, get better, you know, in preparation for his fight. So I was a piece of meat mm. for all these world champions. But I was never anybody's piece of meat because as I got there, I was, if not holding my own, beating them up. Well, I guess that's genius from Brendan yeah. because you didn't have to have all the bright lights. Yeah. You were able to just understand so what, and get that's the education what he and the to, knowledge. He wanted right? me to understand I can do this. Mm. So no matter what he said to me, it, for some reason it wasn't sinking in. He needed me. He knew I was the kind of kid that had to see it for myself yeah. that it was possible. And once I knew it was possible, it was possible. Mm. So, so I was spying with like, uh, a guy called Henry Mask. This guy was a don. He was like a, a former Olympic gold medalist, world light, light heavyweight champion. He was the don. He was like, you'd see him all over the place. I was his sparring partner. I used to batter him. There was a guy called Fabrice Teoso. Uh, he was a world light heavyweight champion. And I can remember when I was at these places, they didn't put me in a plush hotel. They put me in a little dirty shit old bed sit. Uh, and it was horrible. 
And uh, and there was nothing there. It was no TV. He had like the, the, the local radio station, but I'd be there six weeks at a time. And they'd be smart, smart because they'd give you a ticket, you'd fly out there. The return ticket was six weeks later. Right. So if I wanted to go home, I had to find my way from East Germany on the border of Poland all the way to Berlin, find myself and, and then get a pay, a pay a flight back. So so you you were stuck, stuck. there, yeah, you were in yeah, prison. Yeah. So and and I think the penny dropped after years of this when I was spying with Fabrice Steele, so in 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 uh, Lyon, and uh, and I just battered him, and I walked out, and as I walked out of the gym to walk back to my bed sit, there was a, a white stretch limousine, and there was a beautiful mixed race girl sat in the front. She had a little white poodle on her lap, and I'm like, wow, check this out. And Fabrice came just behind me, see you, bye. And he jumped in the car. It was his wife, right? And, and they drove off and it's, and as I watched the car drive off and it's pissing now. I'm stood in the pissing rain thinking, what is wrong with this picture? I've just battered him. And he's driving off in a stretch limousine yeah. to wherever he's going. What are you doing, Johnny? And that's, that to me was the, the eureka moment. Where I thought the difference between them and me is they can perform in public. I couldn't, but now I can. Right. And and all of a sudden, when that penny dropped, I became hungry. Yeah. I thought, yes, give me the chance. But nobody would give me a chance. Nobody thought, Johnny, you're crap. You, you failed twice. You're no good. I thought, you just give me a chance and I'll show you how good I how, how bad I am. And I guess the big thing with that is the not, if you don't go there, if you give up, yeah. you're, you're working on a door again. But if you've got someone there to kind of go, no, 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 come on, come on. Yeah, yeah. So, that's so, the only way you're going to yeah. learn So that, my right? life lesson out of that is, if I had given up at that time, that would have affected every aspect of my life. Yeah. Not just in sport, in relationships, in jobs, in everything. I'd have given up when times were hard. Mm. I'd have walked away when I came across something that was that I just couldn't do. And, and so that, it, was so, it emulated life so much because it gave me a life lesson. If, if you want something enough, you'll get it. Mm. If you, and everything's possible, you've got to want it enough. And your life will, will, will be filled with distractions. I could give you, you see, there's a screen there in the corner. And if your job is to get to that screen and turn it on, or off, and but on your way there, there's going to be a little fire there. Someone, a little dog's going to come and shit on the floor there. And all these things are there. To, this is life. Yeah, all yeah. these things are distracting you from actually just doing what you've got to do. And we get enthralled in that. Let me fix this. I'll just fix that wheel on that skateboard before I go and fix that. What I'm saying is, these are life's life's distractions. It mm. could be job, relationship, family, whatever. If you want something enough. And you stay focused on that something. I'm not saying neglect all these things that distract you in life. What I'm saying is deal with them, but make sure you keep that main focus there. To say, this is what my goal is. And that was my life lesson. And when that penny dropped, and when I eventually came world champion, I understood. And, and, and they say it's a thin line between success and failure. Uh, and it is. Mm. And and I can, I, I can I know what it takes to be successful, but I can't explain it. Uh, I know what that thin line is. I can see it. Whereas before, when I was at the other side of the line, I just didn't understand how to get over it. But when I got over it, I thought, Jesus, genius. But I can never explain to people. It's just hard to explain. So uh, here we go. We're getting there now, guys. We're going to get to the time, <laughs> man. Like, I, don't want it to, like, I wanted to eat this out. But one, one thing, I do want to take a second now to because you know I have really enjoyed like looking into your career and, and Brendan uh, Ingle as well, because I think men that sort of mentorship <laughs> is... I think it's so interesting and in that the word wisdom and, and how you find it and then how you can sometimes pass that on and how that can get through to the next person is an amazing thing. And there was a thing that Brendan Ingle said, which was sort of the most amazing thing you can do for someone is give them their time. That's right. And I, I just want to explain, I literally, I, I've been aware of Johnny's career for a long time because we bumped into each other when you weren't a broadcaster and I wasn't aware that you were a boxer. <laughs> right? But I, I saw you on LinkedIn, I messaged you and like that, yeah. You were like, yeah, let's do it. And we are here doing this right now. So I want to take the second and I want everyone to listen to 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 the thing that you're working on at the moment about your, your fitness and stuff like that. Because how old are you? I'm 53. 50, look at it. You look incredible, <laughs> right? 53. So the, that, wisdom, cool. <laughs> the, that wisdom is there. So yeah. I just want, before we get into that night, and I'm all about the glory, so I'm excited about this bit. But... Just tell me about what you're what you're working on at the moment. Okay, so 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 from being on the Brendan's wing, from being with Brendan, uh, you learn a hell of a lot, uh, and it's about mindset. It's about 
everything's achievable. Uh, right now, I've set up a, 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 a fitness program. It's an online fitness fitness program to basically encourage guys of my age. Mm. To Take say, this jacket off. Yeah, Go on, just, let's show them the again. Yeah, yeah, guys, guys <laughs> of my age that think they're past it, that have had injuries, that all of a sudden think they're old and uh, all of a sudden become old overnight. Mm. Listen, it's not like that. I'm 53 years old. I've had two hip replacements. I've had both knees snapped, but I'm still able to get through this. It's about mindset. It's about... Uh, keeping yourself healthy, keeping yourself fit, keeping yourself motivated. I give myself a 10-year plan. So from 40, once I retire from 40 to 50, I give myself a 10-year plan about how I eat, how I sleep, how, how and it doesn't have to consume your life. I'm not going to try and train like I was 20 years old because I can't, and I've accepted that. Mm. But what I've done is I've kept myself in, 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 a, in a shape where anybody can do it. Uh, now I've given my, myself a plan from 50 to 60 to say, right, this is what we can do. The online app is, is about basically showing people, look, this is how you can train. You don't have to go mad. This is what you can do. And, and it's not just about what you see visually mm. on the app. It's what you hear. It's what the message I'm trying to say to you. You know, so explain you, the product to, to the guys as well. So, just, so basically, you, you go online. I think it's johnnynelson.com. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you go online, and, and as you go online, you'll see a, uh, the, the fitness app that I've created. And it will show you my daily routine of how I train. Mm. Not too hard, not too easy. You can log into it. You can follow it. You can, you can be picked up by it. And it's just, it, again, it's not just about training your body. It's about training your mind. And that's most important. It's about training that, your mind. Mm. Uh, and so, and as you watch it, as you get enthralled in it, you think, I can do this. I want people to look at this and think, I can do that. I'm not Superman. I'm not, I'm not, I'm just, I'm just an average Joe. But all, it's about, it's about <laughs> mindset. But it's the truth. It's about mindset. Wait, this whole podcast and being able to chat to you and your whole career is about mindset and, yeah. and the penny dropping and, and training your mind and stuff like that. So go check that out. There's a link yeah. in the description. Um, I, I think if you've listened this far and you, you're now aware of Johnny and his life, then it can be done. And uh, in terms of sort of, yeah, training your mind and the penny dropping, that came to a head on that night when you, you know, finally became world champion. And looking at the footage, it's a different person. Completely. You're snarling at the guy. Yeah. You're talking to Carl Thompson, wasn't yeah. it? Who's a very, very, very yeah. good fighter. Talk me through that night. Okay, so, so in the build-up to that fight, Carl Thompson, I used to be a fan of Carl Thompson's. Carl Thompson was the WBO champion. Carl Thompson's body was like that of an Adonis. I used to love watching him. He'd knock people out. He was tough. And I'd say to my mates, come on, let's watch this guy. I never thought I'd fight him. And so then, it, then and Carl was world champion. I was a fan of his. But then eventually I found myself in a position where I was to fight Carl Thompson. Mm. So, so again, we'll go back to school days. I was great at causing trouble, never good at backing it up. So Carl is a straight guy. He's a very straight, no-nonsense kind of guy. So they were the best guys to pick on to try and to wind up because you could say stuff that they took seriously. That weren't that serious. So my job was to make Carl hate me because if he hated me, he'd want to kill me. And then if he wanted to kill me, then he couldn't think straight. He couldn't think about round one, I want to do this round. Two, I'm going to do that. He's just thinking, I want to smash your face in. So my job was to get under his skin, make him really dislike me. So, so I've got the reputation of being a coward. Now, regardless of what I'd achieved at that point, the reputation of being a runner, reputation of being a backward fighter, you know, and, and, but I now knew what I was capable of doing. Mm. And I swore and promised to myself that the, the only way I'm coming out of this ring is as a winner. I will not lose this fight unless they carry me out. I had that in my mindset. I knew everybody expected me to run on the back foot and, and try and, but I knew then, I knew what I was capable of doing. I knew what I'd done with all the, the world champions around the world. So when it came to the fight, unfortunately, you can't see it on, on, on the footage, but, and I loved coming out first uh, when they introduced us into the ring. And, and, and because I knew once I was in the ring, I knew when he came out, I'm who he'd see. Because mm. Anthony Joshua spoke about this, didn't he, in terms of the Ruiz yeah. fight. Did you talk with Anthony Joshua about yeah. that yeah, element we, of it? Yeah, we, we talked about many things. I'm saying it's about mindset. Mm. So, so when you got to think, if you're going out to fight somebody, Everybody has those nerves and they deal with it differently. So when Carl Thompson comes out and he's thinking, can he, can't, I'm going to do this, that, and the other. Then he sees me and I, the camera was on him when he came out. But if the camera was panned on me, I was stood on that corner post, which is, which is close to him, shouting, come on, you fuck. And he's like, what the fuck? And, and I'm snarling, I'm grounding, I'm, I'm the biggest I could possibly be. Yeah. That's what he sees. And if you look at the footage, you see Carl Thompson's eyes like, he's got a right crazy smile. <laughs> 
and then it turns into a snarl because he's seen me. That's what he's seeing. Wow. So he's trying to smile it off and he went, fuck. <laughs> he's walking in and I knew I'm going to take it to you. I'm going to, I'm going to take it to you no matter what mm. you want. There's nothing you have that I haven't experienced. And even before the fight, I was in the gym and there was a Carl Thompson. You used to be do mixed martial arts. Everybody is fan of his. There was two guys in my gym that used to do mixed martial arts, Jonathan Thaxton and, and Pele Reed, good fighters. And I can remember, I was a proper gym rat. I was always in the gym, first one and last one out. And uh, and I can remember being in the gym and John Thaxton and Carl uh, and, and Pele Reed, they were fans of, of Carl Thompson. And so they both teamed up and he said, uh, as I'm getting dried off, they said, so why do you think this fight will go with Carl? This is fight week before the fight. And I went, what do you mean? You know he's tough, don't you? Aren't you? So I know where their mindset is. Yeah, he is. But how do you think you can be him? I said, I'll knock him out. Mm. These are my gym mates. Yeah. And I'm like, mm. uh, well, you just know he's tough. So I knew where, the, where their mind were, thinking he's going to get slaughtered here. Mm. Uh, but you're so hardened by this point, mentally, yeah, yeah, aren't you? Completely. So nobody can influence me. Nobody can tell me. But this was talked to me about Brendan. You are going to experience every side of boxing when nobody can tell you what you know because you've done everything. You've won, you've lost, you've been a journeyman, you've been a winner, you've been knocked out, you've, been, you've done everything. So, so, and that, so I was a fully rounded fighter at this point now. And I knew I was smarter than everybody out there. But just because I haven't said it just doesn't mean I'm not it. Mm. So when they're saying what they're saying, mm. and then Brendan came, picked me up, we left the gym, we're driving up Newman Road. Sorry, can I, that's such a that's such a wise comment to make in, in today's world. The fact that just because you haven't said it doesn't mean you you are it. Because I think there's a lot of people saying it. Yeah. Like at any level, be it a sportsman, be it a, an influencer, be it a, a musician, whatever. They're all saying they're all letting everyone know what that my be. life's great and everything going well. And just if you're not the person that isn't saying that, that doesn't mean you don't exactly. Have, you doesn't don't have that it. doesn't mean you can't do it. And that's what and th this that's true power. That's true power. It's like it, 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 it's. It, that knowledge is power. So if people take, if you, a great saying, another Brendan saying, play the fool to catch the wise. Let them think what they want. Let them think you're no good. Let them think you've got no confidence. You know what you're capable of doing. So you've got that in your army to say, you know what, you have absolutely no idea what's going to hit you. And it's so easy to de blurt, blurt something out mm. and put someone in a, in a place. But the, the sweetest moment is when you surprise them with it. And you answer every question they've got when you're in the room with them. I remember Brendan came in the gym as I got changed. We jumped in the car, we're driving the road. I said, Bren, I don't get it. He said, what, what's that? I said, I don't see how I can lose. And he went, good. I said, am I missing something? And he went, no. And it was that, <laughs> it was that kind of, I'm, I'm like, I'm a, because after these guys had said what I said, I'm thinking, am I so confident that I, I'm, not, I'm missing the wood for the trees? Mm. I said, I'm missing something because I don't see how I can lose. So you must be so brilliant with the gloves is off now. Because, I mean, a lot of people know you for that. Yeah. I mean, it's it's such an integral part of a fight week now. Yeah. It's easier. It's, you know, part of me thought, should we move the chairs around <laughs> doing that way? But the, the, it's, su it's such an amazing interview. And you see, you know, see the whites of people's eyes. Yeah. So now when you're seeing these... Yeah. Do you know the truth? You know your truth. You can yeah. tell. Trust me. You know when Is someone... there one that we could go back and watch and you go... Uh... Something that you knew that people didn't. Right. Unfortunately, there's one that's not being aired, and that was Anthony Joshua against uh, Big Baby Miller. And Anthony Joshua, for the first yeah. time, he let that corporate mask slip uh, because May Miller was saying things that were really disrespectful to right. Anthony Joshua and about his family. The ones you could go back and watch are the original one was Carl Froch and George Groves. Uh, the famous saying. First can, fight. Yeah. yeah. No, and the second fight. Oh, sorry. When they say we can all have a push and a pull and Carl pulled him over the table. Genius. Uh, because Carl all of a sudden was a completely different individual. Carl before disrespected George Groves and thought, you're not, you're not good enough to beat me. Mm. He almost lost the first fight. Now he'd been to a sports psychologist that had opened his mind, opened his way of thinking, you know, made him sit on his ego, you know, to say, you know, don't let your ego control who you are. George Groves, was complacent, say, I've got your number, I'm going to get you next time. And Carl, you could see it was like two caged tigers sat at either, either side, but Carl was sharper, he was smarter as before, it was the other way around. Mm. Because George, Carl didn't have George's number, now he has got his number. So now George thinks he's got Carl's number. Not thinking, respecting all the things Carl had gone through, mentally, to get to this position again. Mm. 
And if you watch the fight, you watch the t to and fro of mental, mental warfare. I love that because I could see what was happening and I could see how, how it was going on. You had two fighters that really believed they would win, but I knew one fighter knew something the other didn't. Is there a, is there a general sort of tell? That you can see? Uh, yeah, so so I've always said when we do that show, we should have like uh, live a live feed uh, coming in. So for when you walk in, like when we walked in here, everybody said hello and everything. Mm. We should have that in the studio and then cut off before we start the show. Because in doing that, that is, it's, 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 it's so great to watch because you see the fighters circling around, talking to the people, looking at each other and they're talking away like they're not bothered, but you see one over glance at the other like this. Looking mm. down, you it's, can see it all. It's like a ring in itself. Yeah, it's a, and, and you can see everybody milling around, getting the mics ready to sound, and you can see the fighters coming in, and you can just see them all prepping themselves. And 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 we should do a live feed to see that, and then just taste test it out, mm. taste it out. And people are thinking, fucking ah, oh, this is gonna be great, this. Yeah, yeah. Because the amount of that things be that had happened before, uh, Anthony Joshua against... Um, Against Miller again, he, he didn't come on on screen. So what happened was these two were doing a press conference, uh, done a, 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 a attempt at doing a gloves are off in in America, which didn't work unfortunately. <laughs> um, <laughs> so they only managed to film eight minutes of it because right. both fires it kicked off, they stormed out. So now the security is worried. I just had them at a hip replacement, so I was at home, you know, on on tramadol, out my tree. I'm crying at Emmerdale, right? <laughs> so I'm in a bad state. So they phoned me on the Thursday, said, "Johnny, we want you in London on the on the Monday. We're gonna they, these guys are in the UK. We want you in London to do the gloves are off." I'm like, "Get a grip of yourself, boy," yeah. because I'm I'm drugged up because I'm I'm on painkillers. So mm. I thought, "Stop the painkillers, take the pain. Stop the painkillers. I'm in pain, yeah, you know." And so. Because that's get, a, you're, it's such a complicated thing to host as well. And yeah. I don't think anyone else could do it because you you have to totally understand all the nuances to understand, and say the yeah. right thing and at the right time. That's what you've got to say at the right time. You've got to you've got to understand when somebody's bullshitting or not. You've got to catch somebody out on what they said. You've yeah. got to be able to catch them on their history. So so as I got down to to London, I'm on crutches now. I'm, I've not had any drugs to to take the pain away. So I'm in pain. I'm sweating. So when the producer saw me, she went, "Oh my god." Johnny, what are you going to do if it kicks off? I said, be cool, don't worry about it. Let me go and talk to fighters first. So on the crutches, I went to Baby Miller's dressing room and I said, uh, I said, you all right? He said, yeah, I said, have a good show. I know you guys tried it the day before. Listen, say what you want. Just try and keep it clean and do me a favor. If you try and hit him, please don't miss because if you miss, you're going to fuck me up. <laughs> Because I'm not fast enough to get away. So he laughed a little bit. He said, oh, don't, no, don't worry, man. I'll make sure it. I get him straight. <laughs> so I thought, just calm it down a little bit. Like, like, yo. So anyway, I came out, crushed it again. Went to Anthony Joshua's green room. I said, you're right. He said, yeah, yeah. Because he asked me about the operation. Oh, good. I said, listen to me. Do me a favor. Uh, just try and keep it clean because I know what happened last time. Just do what you're doing. Send what you want. I ain't got a problem with it. But if you're going to start scuffing, just take it that way. Don't come in my way because I can't even get out of the chair. Because mm. once I sit down, I'm stuck in the chair. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. So they're laughing. So we get inside. It's it's like a, a military operation sitting me on the chair back to front. Because throughout my legs, I sit down. I'm like, I'm stuck. So if it kicks off, I'm just going to have to drop, you know, <laughs> stop, drop and roll with the chair. Cover myself yeah. with the chair. So those two, yeah, 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 so those two, those two come in. So uh, as we start, everybody's position, we good, we good. And I wish they had the cameras there. It was, it was the, you could cut the atmosphere in that with a knife. Mm. I said, boys, keep it clean, we're good. So, um, uh, AJ, um, this guy's been saying some things that have really got under your, under your skin. AJ went, yeah, fuck him. I'm, gonna, I'm like, what? <laughs> whoa, 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 yeah. Fuck you, motherfucker. And everybody's like, whoa, whoa, wow. boys, stop, stop, easy, easy. Come on. We can't use any of this stuff. Mm. Let's start again. Let's start and just calm down and fuck him. If I cut him in two, every part of him would be rotten. I'm like, shit. And so the amount of times we had to stop and start, it's proper hatred. Yeah. And 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 uh, AJ said, I am going to meet you in the center ring and I'm going to take you out. You are going to get stretched out. It was it was a different side to him. This guy had said stuff to really get under his skin. Mm. And all Baby Miller kept, and other things what Baby Miller kept saying was, uh, you're on drugs, you're a drug. I kept accusing him of taking <sighs> drugs. You know, he kept talking about, it. I'm like, mm. you know, and so, and, but it really got bad. We managed to get a bit, get a program out of it. And then obviously Miller failed the drug test. So the pro, the, the program would have seen a different side to Anthony Joshua, which he's going to need yeah. when he fights, if he fights Tyson Fury, if he fights, 
um, Deontay Wilder, if he fights uh, a Dylan White, he's going to need that personality. Because they're going to play that role. Because they are so going to say stuff to poke him, to get to him. And they're not fearful of him. Mm. They're going to be disrespectful. They're going to try and undermine him. So being that polite individual, what says, yeah, no, and corporately friendly, he can't be that guy because they destroy him. And I wonder if that was the perfect storm with losing the fight to Ruiz, where you've got a guy that you are so angry yeah. at, and then there's this dude, this little blob that you yeah. think well, that was, <laughs> that, that, that was really a nice. problem. And he was, Ruiz was clammy. He's, put his arm around him, all right, let him have the glove. So all of a sudden, when you're when you're focused to fight him and he pulls out and you're focused to fight him, he's like, oh God. And you can't help but disrespect him and, and just overlook him. Mm. And that's what happened. The aftermath of that brought that raw Anthony Joshua out because all of a sudden he he, he saw people criticise him, talk negatively about him. So all those people that were tapping him on his back saying, you're great, this, that, and the other, all of a sudden people are calling him a coward. They're calling him useless. And so now he's feeling a little bit of what I felt. Yeah. He's, seeing, he's seeing how human nature can be so fickle. So all of a sudden now when you listen to Anthony Joshua talk, there's a bit of rawness there about him. For the first time, if you go back and listen to the fight after he lost to Ruiz, the first time you ever hear him swear on TV, I fucked up there, sorry. You know, so the mask is dropping. He's mm. thinking, you know, why do I have to be polite when all these guys are saying this, that, and the other? I'm going to be myself. You know, so so eventually when those three names that I said are sat with Anthony Joshua, you are going to see Anthony Joshua be Anthony Joshua. Right. But I'm, what I'm saying is I've, had, I've done 30 years of having to learn and understand the process of, of what makes you the ultimate fighter. Anthony Joshua's done it in a condensed period of 11 years mm. and he's still not finished learning but yeah. but he's learned a harsh lesson and i'm glad in a way i'm glad he lost to louise because if he didn't lose to louise and he still went in with the same attitude he had before he watched louise he'd have he'd have he'd have been shocked mm. now he's got a hunger he wants to fight it's not about the money he's a multi-millionaire it's now about he wants it he yeah. really wants it from there and that makes all the difference and we're getting to that point where i want to talk about your legacy because you know, for you, we've spoken about those defeats that are there, talking about Joshua and his legacy. And I think if he's able to beat Fury, yeah. and the same, I think Fury, the sort, the story's there, the legacy's there already to a point because he's had the dip to get the, mm. the high. Joshua, it was just, he was, you know, he's, he's carved out of stone, he's winning every fight, he's polite, he's brand friendly, all those things. He needed that moment, needed that adversity. To make him to hungry. Fully, yeah. yeah. And so if... Whoever wins it, Fury or Joshua, when that time comes, they're going to have that moment that would have, I imagine would have been similar to you when you've yeah. been forgotten, been abused by yeah. the, your hometown, been defeated. And then you have the moment where the fight gets stopped against Carl Thompson. Yeah. The thing I love the most about sport is glory and hard-earned glory. I, you, you cannot choreograph it. I knew... When I box Carl Thompson, I'm re I'm rehearsing my speech, my stance. I want it to be like Cantona when he scored that goal and stood there. And everyone went crazy. Like, I could, and this was in my head. So I thought, when I stop him, I'm just going to stand in the ring like, cool. Like, yeah, I told you. Mm. It doesn't work like that. So, Are you so, pleased it doesn't work like so, that? So I, 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 I was mad at myself at the time. So when I won... I dropped to my knees and rolling around the floor. Bro, I'm like, and as I'm down, I'm like, get up, you idiot, get up. This is not what you're supposed to do. No, no, get up. And so, so it was like, and again, I've mentioned about dreaming of fights and stuff. And it's a bit weird if you don't get it, if you don't believe in it. And it was like an angel had lifted a massive weight off my shoulder and I dropped. I didn't want to do that. That was honestly, it wasn't choreographed. You couldn't. I, I, I had a really cool stance mm. to, to drop after I'm just standing to say like, yeah, I might have even done the mole. But, <laughs> but what I'm saying is I, that was planned. But then when I dropped, it was like a spirit had lifted the weight of the world off my shoulders as if to say, Eureka, you've got it. And I was rolling about on the floor and I can, I can remember the argument, man. Get up, Johnny, get up. I can't get up, Johnny, get up. <laughs> And so Dominic, Dominic Ingle came down and he got me, he said, you wipe those tears away. Get up, get up. <laughs> right, right. Stood up, lips are swelling, eyes are swelling. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I know I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> and this, this, this was the situation. And then even when I sat at ringside to do uh, the interview, again, I'd already rehearsed what I was going to say, but none of it came out of my mouth. And straight away... I thought I need to give credit where credit is due. I now believe 1000% in Brendan Ingle's system. 
Whereas before I doubted it, whereas before he was the only person I trusted in, in all that situation, whereas before I thought, well, is he, isn't he? I believe everything Brennan had taught me, said to me, he, all the little little the bits of philosophy he gave me. And I, it was to me, it was like giving it him. I couldn't give him anything else. Mm. It, I, it, I, I couldn't think of how can I give this man something that he's not had. So I had to say, I am a product of the gym. I'm a product of Brendan Ingle. Uh, I, I entered this sport with no talent, no natural ability, no nothing. I'm a product of the gym. I am the gym. Mm. I can recite that over and over and over again. I didn't plan that. Mm. But every word of that is the truth. You can always remember the truth. You can't remember a lie. Yeah. So when I said that, this was from the heart. You speak from the heart. People sense, they feel, they know the truth. And so when I said that, I still believe it. Uh, I, and and, and it's, it, it's, a, it's, it's me doing that to all the people that mocked Brendan, his, his style of fighting, all the people that mocked our gym, all the people that took the piss, all the fighters that had broke his heart, that, it, that he'd spent like his life working with. And remember at that time as well, one of Brendan's protégés, Prince Nassim Hamid had left and was all that. And Naz had actually sponsored or not endorsed my opponent's corner. So they all came in with Prince Nassim Hamid t-shirts on, you know, and so I thought, Naz, if you ever give me a reason to want to win, is now. Mm. I'm going to batter him. I'm going to batter him and all those guys that are wearing your t-shirts. And this was, even though it might have been aimed at me, this was my chance to, to fight for Brendan, to fight for what he does. Because guys that have been in the gym and slagged down the system, slagged down Brendan's philosophy, they, that what kills him is, I've been there from the beginning. I've never left. And for me to have 13 amateur fights, only win three, and end up being world champion, defend it 13 times, it says to them, you're wrong. Because if they can do that with Johnny Nelson, who you all used to beat up, mm. and he can end up where he is, you're wrong. Can you can you explain that process to kind of bring it back a bit? That So Brendan Ingle... His gym, his philosophy. Can you explain his process in terms of creating fighters in two senses? Well, okay, no, no, not two senses. So, <laughs> so basically, it was it's never about training the, just the body. It's about training the mind. It's about mindset. Now, Brendan always said, "I can have you ninety percent fit, uh, uh, or, or, or can I can have you a ninety percent mentally fit and ten percent physically fit, and mm -hmm. I can make you a winner. The other way around, I can make you a loser." You've got to believe in it. You've got to believe in what you're doing. You've got to have the right attitude, right philosophy in regards to fighting. Ego can be your biggest enemy. So you've got to know when uh, when, and uh, to, to, to put it on a fighter. If you can control a fighter, not by hitting him, by letting him try and hit you and riding the shot and slipping the shot and making him think that he's on top, then you turn it around. Mm. That's ultimate control. When you control someone, when they don't know they're being controlled, this is mindset. This is mental warfare. Yeah. If you go in Brendan's house, he's got books on 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 philosophy, on on people like Genghis Khan, Marcus Aurelius, and this guy played, and his words, not mine, he played the thick paddy, so he pretended like he didn't know anything, and th and then all of a sudden he'd come up with nuggets of genius. I'm thinking, wow, I didn't know that, mm. you know, and and so it was about mental, getting you right mentally. Anybody and everybody, even if you don't fight, we can get in the gym, I can get you to my fitness. But if your mind is not of an understanding of where it has to be, it means nothing. Well, there was a, one of my favorite videos that I watched during that period for the Logan Paul KSI fight was actually you and Joe Weller mm. talking about the fight and how it would work. And you were li literally taking yeah. him through it and he was, it, he was loving that. And then you spoke about Joe and his fight with KSI. Because Joe is, I mean, everyone, everyone loves Joe and because Joe is kind of, like an open book in terms yeah. of like heart on his sleeve. He's a very intense individual. Very, Joe, yeah. yeah. Very serious. Yes. And and it, that's exactly what kind of cost him the, the KSI fight in terms of, yeah. and it was very similar to, to your first fight because it was about, it wasn't about him winning or losing. He'd, he'd had the overload yeah. and he'd let himself Internally down. Internally combusted. And what it, what it is, is again, it's ego. It's ego because you, 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 your, your ego can be your biggest enemy. Now, if you are prepared to lose a battle to win a war, you've got to do that. Mm. Give a round away, you know, but not think, I've got to win every second of every round. I've got to do this. You've got to play the fool to catch the wide. You've got to be able to poke someone and make them think they can do you. Mm. Give them that, that minute. Give them that hour. Give them that day. But then if you can do that, then the sweetest feeling is knowing 
that you it's because of you they are thinking like that because the way you spoke idea. to him was such you spoke to him with him with such passion mm. about I'll train you you yeah. like oh, you oh, made that offer because to him I, can, I know I know I, I when I when he was speaking I know I thought I could so turn you around because yeah. I, I, I've I met you in me I've met you in so many different shapes and sizes and I know exactly what the issue is there and I said let me let me train you let me just but he, he doesn't want it enough and I and if he does want it enough I want it I'm saying to him look it's that. Mm. It's that more than anything. You train that, change that mindset. I will turn you into a beast and you will get that fight. If it's just for that one fight, let me just get you ready for that one fight. And, and you, and it will check because that one fight will haunt him for the rest of his life. The stick, the memes he got after that fight will always haunt him, will always hurt him. And he, even if when there's not a camera around and no one's around and someone has a bit of a poke at him about losing a fight, it'll piss him off, yeah. but he'll think, all right. And this will follow him. Remember what I said. If I didn't change my my mindset, every every loss I'd have had would uh, it would have affected my life uh, in every walk, every part of my life. And with Joe, that loss, that 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 criticism, that the effect of after that fight will affect decisions he makes, how he makes those decisions, and it will just it will just make, put him out of tilter. I can put him back on track again. Mm. And this is what I was trying to say to him. Yeah, but he didn't I, want to hear it. Yeah, did he didn't he? want it. And all I, all I just said to him, look, it just depends on how much you want it. Mm. If you want it enough, we can we can do this. Yeah, anybody can do it, but you just got the right mindset. I feel like with you that there must be such a nice little glow in terms of understanding how your career ended and and therefore how your you know your legacy as a boxer is a really lovely, well rounded mm. story that I, I can enjoy years on when I get to chat to you about it. Um, do you think you would have been okay with your legacy if you'd not won that world title? Uh, Do you think you'd been able to get around it? No, because once I'd gone down that path, some people are born, they know the path in life. Some people know what path they want to get. And some people accidentally fall on that path. I accidentally fell on that path. And so once I once I I'd, I'd understood this is my path in life, you know, it couldn't have been any other way. Um, and what I'm saying is you don't have to be a world champion. You don't have to be a winner. You've just got to understand you. You've got to believe in you. You've got to, you've got to not lie to you. If you try your hardest, win or lose, once you've done it, you think, you know what? I gave my all. Mm. I tried my hardest. Uh, and I was just beaten by the better man or woman in whatever you're doing in life. I think if I didn't box, God knows what I'd have been. Um, I don't know if it'd have been a criminal or a cop. You know, I, I don't know which way they've gone. Uh, but I think through meeting brendan not boxing through meeting brendan the mindset he gave me uh because of him it's made me the man i am today and and that's why i i, I do talk so i talk to kids at schools and colleges i talk to, to businessmen and, and 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 to motivate them to tell them look this is possible because I, when i talk i don't have a script i don't have cue cards again you can always remember the truth you can't remember the lie so basically i tell them my story mm. and let them understand I want you to understand, feel like, you know what? I'm like him. You know what? I, I thought that. I'm not some superstar of the TV. I'm just a guy that just happened to work and be on TV. Yeah. And so I'm no better than anybody else. And I need people, boys, girls, men, women, to understand everything's possible. Things don't have to be so serious or so, so life-threatening. It's just about mindset. You get that right. No matter what you do in life, you think, you know what? Life's good. And that, that's how simple it is. Mm. Last two questions. So one is one that I ask everyone that comes on the process. And actually, it kind of needs to be two questions within it because we've covered so much ground. When you were fighting, in I guess the difficult days, probably the smart way of doing it, what kept what kept you up at night? Uh, when, when I was fighting and losing, you mean, um, what kept me up at night was that, that inner voice basically saying, you're better than this. You know, and, and because it's it's very easy to give up. It's very easy to create an excuse to say, now nah, I'm going to do this. Nah. And I kept, I, I I would be stuck between the devil and the deep blue sea. I'd, I'd listen to the excuses I could use. Mm. Or I'd listen to my consciousness saying, no, no, Johnny, come on. I'm honest with myself. So, so, so when I went with the honesty of myself, I think, right, if I do this, I'll learn from that. I'll do this. And once I went with that, no matter what happened in my life, I've gone with the honesty of myself. But if I've gone with that side and give myself an excuse, it doesn't matter if everybody believed me. When I close my eyes, I know 
I've, 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 I'm bullshitting. I've made myself an excuse. You can lie to everybody. You just can't lie to yourself because if you do that, you will be forever in hell, Men emotionally, yeah, yeah, yeah. in everything you do. And it will always creep up on you when you least expect it. So I'm so glad I went down that side and I thought, no, that's where we're going to. Yeah. You've got to be honest with yourself. Yeah. And, and, and even when, and, and remember, all those distractions were there. When I was in that mindset, I, I, I can remember being hungry and having no money, having been stuck in a dirty little bed seat. I can remember all those conditions that could easily be my excuse to say, no, nah, I'm going home. No, I'm coming out. I want, mm -mm, this is what I'm going to do. Mm. Let's do this. And it's that decision. That's that decision. It's that easy. That's that. It, they say the truth will set you free. And I know it's not really might sound corny, but if you're honest with yourself, you will get everything you want. As a 53 year old man, what keeps you up at night now? <laughs> uh, I love life. Uh, as a 53 year old man, I love life. I uh, I think, what's the next adventure? And I think, uh, I actually like being 53. Um, I actually smile to myself. I, I, it's it's comforting knowing that I've already done that path because it's not an easy path. Mm. It's comforting watching people going through that and and helping people just to say if you listen to me we can cut that part out if you listen to me if you don't i'll just watch it unfold mm. and so sometimes when you see when i saw anthony joshua and he lost his fight at the time it was doom and gloom for everybody but i thought trust me you, but yeah. you trust me the best thing could have happened mm. because the sun's gonna shine again but at that time when i'm watching it and everybody's like oh my god i'm like it was it was nice to watch. I'm thinking this story will change. Yeah. Time will tell its own story. I think another reason for you to be excited is that it's you know it's a long life. Like, you know, you've mm. got this whole thing that we barely touched on your broadcasting and you've still got another twenty years of yeah. that. You know, again, it's amazing. That's what I'm saying. Again, you know, I think I've had I've been fortunate to to be a bit of a chameleon uh and adjust through life and and still, you know, i I'm, I'm actually probably more well known now than when I boxed. I'm like How's that work? <laughs> I'm a world champion. Do you know who I am? You need to get one made. <laughs> so, with it. So, it, and again, when kids say, "Did you used to box?" I'm like, "You cheeky <laughs> bastard!" But, uh, but it makes me smile. I'm not. I ain't got an ego. And, and I must admit, I'm just like. I can remember being sat with David Hay and and um, Carl Froch, and they were talking about um, uh, representing their country and going to all these other countries and fight for their country. And I was like, I found like listening to him thinking, oh my God. And I actually thought I shouldn't be in this conversation. Yeah. Because I thought I've not done what you guys have done. I've not I've worn the England vest. I've not represent, I've been good enough to represent my country. And so this was, again, I'm, I'm, I'm reverting back to that. You shouldn't be here. You're on a hustle, Yeah, man. yeah. And so with the things I've achieved, I look back and think, I understand how I did it. I understand what it took. I understood it's not easy. Uh, but I understood as Brendan said, it was easy. Everybody would be doing it. And that's Very how sure. life is. And final one, people got mad if I don't ask you about this. Tyson uh, Tyson Fury versus Anthony Joshua. Yeah. It's got to happen at some stage. How do you see... Because I, I saw a clip and you were talking about... You took, you're, you're so wise. Even at that time, <laughs> you were like... I talked to fighters, I think you were talking about Henry Cooper and saying how, you know, he, he'd become a, a bit bitter because he didn't wasn't able to get the money because the world had moved yeah. forward. And then you're talking about, you know, I'm making a bit more money now, but with the internet, in a few years' time, you get, get everyone to pay a quid, you've got four million quid. And that is literally the world that we're in That's right now. That's from Brendan. That's what Brendan said about Naz. Naz coming through is from the Yemen. He said the population was on about 40 million in Yemen. He said if they all paid a pound, this will be the first multi-millionaire from, from England. Like Everybody's looking at Brendan thinking, you're mad. Naz is worth at least 70 million now. Really? Wow. Uh, and so so you talk about Tyson Fury and, and uh, Anthony Joshua. Without a doubt, I believe Tyson Fury technically is the best uh, fighter out there and could just you just explain that to me very very quickly because i think you know the casual fan goes oh hang on a minute like yeah. you know joshua just looks like the yeah, perfect no, boxer, no, no, so the, the, devil, like the devil's in the detail mm. so technically the biggest puncher in the world is down to wilder the biggest puncher he's still lost technically when it comes to the art of boxing the sweet science uh throwing the double jab and, and thinking about reading the fight is tyson fury the all-rounder someone who can box and punch mm. is anthony joshua so, so A can beat B, B can beat A, and C can... So everybody could beat everybody at some one given time. So it's a case of you look and think, will Tyson Fury's boxing IQ be able to outfox uh, a fighter like Anthony Joshua that's had to adapt 
that can learn massively. And the reason why I give Anthony Joshua credit is because all in all, he's been boxing 11 years. Look what he's done in 11 years. Most fighters spend 11 years as an amateur, then they turn pro and then start getting the experience as a professional. So I know Anthony Joshua's got the mindset and understanding to devise a game plan to, to, to navigate his way through with somebody, somebody like uh, um, Tyson Fury. Mm. Uh, he's just and, got that coach that he's had for such yeah, a long yeah, time that's right. as well. Which who is great. he respects. Mm. Uh, and he's, like, he's had to learn his harsh lesson. Tyson Fury hasn't had that hard, harsh lesson to learn. He's never lost. Yeah. So all of a sudden, it, it, that, that humbleness, you know, he hasn't got it. But now he's got that belief as if to say, you know, it's my given right. Mm. And so, so that's why when I say Tyson Fury technically is the best in the world, doesn't mean I don't think Anthony Joshua can win. I'm just giving everybody their merits and their attributes. And so, so it's a game. It's like chess. You've got to put things in the right place. Things have got to happen at a certain time. And so, it's about game plan when you get in the ring. And would you would you give me a name? How would you? Because this is the thing I was chatting to my friend about it, and we were, we were saying that often with this, and it's a great thing about boxing is the closer you get to the fight, you go. Everyone Change starts to mind. go. Yeah, everyone changes their mind. Yeah. I've done it so many times because you go. Oh no! Well, I've heard this now, so now it's a 50-50 fight. I think when you've got that distance, you can probably have a calmer yeah. like look at it. So, you, you so, it so, so, out? so again, you look at both fights and you think, I, I, I'm stuck between the devil again and the deep blue sea because I like both fighters. So it's, this is nothing personal. Mm. Uh, I look at both fighters' last fights. Uh, I'm impressed with how Anthony Joshua turned his style around and totally outboxed a guy that beat him up the fight before. I look at Tyson Fury and, and he showed a, a complete 100% boxing IQ. You look at the IQ of both fighters as a boxer, the better boxer is Tyson Fury. So mm -hmm. if they boxed each other, I'd side with Tyson Fury. But if they got into a tear with each other and crossed swords with each other, I'd say the knockout power is Anthony Joshua's because I know Anthony Joshua can punch harder than Tyson Fury. I've sparred with Tyson Fury. Tyson Fury, when he beat Deontay Wilder, he boxed the fight out of him but to the point where, where they just thought, stop, I just can't touch you. I sparred with, Anthony, with Tyson Fury at the back end of my career when he was a young man coming through. Right. For the size of him, and if you look at the fight, he was 19 stone plus and he hit him with full-blooded shots and still didn't knock him out. But he had that, he, he could build up that, that, the amount of ammunition, they're rat -a -tat -tat, rat -a -tat -tat. If, I, if a bee stings you, it'll hurt. Two bees sting you, it'll hurt. Three bees sting you, sting you it'll be fucking hurt. <laughs> if you get stung with 50 bees, you're going to be on your knees <laughs> thinking, shit, all right. Do you understand? Yeah, not the that's, analogy I was expecting, but that, it's a good that, one. <laughs> that's, that's Tyson Fury. Uh, yeah. Anthony Joshua, he's a truck. Mm. So if you get hit by a truck, that one shot, you're done. <laughs> I'll do it, yeah. So it's a case of what gets in first, what's going to work first. Uh, Anthony, uh, Titan Fury had the, the foresight of a second fight with Deontay Wilder. So the first fight, he thought, I think I can beat him. Mm. The second fight, he knew he could beat yeah. him. Now he's getting in with Anthony Joshua. He thinks he can beat him, but he doesn't know he can, and vice versa. Mm. So it'll be a different fight, a different type of confidence, a different type of attitude when you go in, because you don't know what's to happen what's yeah. to come yeah which i mean takes it right back to the start doesn't it so i think the, the big thing to take from this is if you put money on it anthony joshua will knock him out in the gloves are off yeah and then when it gets <laughs> to the actual fight tyson will win that one no 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 uh, you know actually in the gloves are off i think tyson fury will is, is he'll win that verbally yeah uh, tyson fury will win the gloves are off between the two yeah because, i don't think i've seen him lose well. yeah yeah because his, his iq of boxing the history of our sport is second to none. Mm. You have, you watch Tyson Fury, and if you watch any interviews of him, when he uses the word shit house, he doesn't just say it for effect. He, what he means is you're full of shit. So so basically, he knows out uh, the sport inside out, the history of our sport. And I've seen him in a room when people are talking about the sport of boxing and talking about what happened in this fight. And he'll sit there; he's happy to play the fool to catch the wise. He'll sit back and watch everybody listen and talk. And then when somebody's got something factually wrong, he'll not say, "Ah, you're wrong." They'll just let you carry on, finish your sentence, and they'll say, you're a shit house." Anyway, and, and that's how he deals with it. Because and this guy knows the history of our sport. Now, that's my only worry. Anthony Joshua needs to submerge himself in the history of our sport. Mm. And then it's in your blood. It's in your, it's in your, your DNA. And that's, that's, again, a big difference, a big plus side for, for Tyson Fury. Johnny, Pleasure so, so nice chatting <laughs> to you. Thank you so much. Uh, guys. 
like this video right this second. Swipe up. Swipe up. Check out the description. <laughs> <laughs> wrong, wrong platform. It's fine. Um, check out all the other episodes of The Process. Subscribe to the channel if you want to see more. Let me know who you want me to chat to next. And uh, as I say, check out uh, the the app, isn't it? JohnnyNelson.com. There you go. Yeah, no, check not JohnnyNelson.com. Whatever. Check out the app. Fitness app is there. Thanks, mate. Amazing. What an education. Loved it.